We are going to get started here um, as we select ourselves. Really nice to see everybody here today. Um, and we will get started with the webinar, I think, as well, so that we're, we're joining both folks online and folks in person. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us today in whatever way you are doing that. Um, my name is Kate Evans, and I direct the Immigrant Rights Clinic at Duke Law. We're thrilled to partner with Duke's International Human Rights Clinic to host Professor Karen Masalo, the founding director of the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies at UC Hastings College of Law, as part of Duke's ongoing Human Rights in Practice series. The series and today's event are also co-sponsored by the Center for International and Comparative Law, the Duke Immigrant and Refugee Project, the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute, the Duke Human Rights Center at the Keenan Center for Ethics, the Human Rights Law Society, the International Law Society, Duke Law ACLU, and the Middle East and North African Law Student Association. Thank you to everybody for joining in today. We really appreciate it. So um, as we get started here, uh, policies regarding access to asylum and international refugee protections have become a regular staple of headline news under the Trump and Biden administrations. We've seen asylum seekers housed in refugee camps at the southern border, children separated from their parents, mass expulsions under a public health order, the deportations of thousands of Haitian migrants, and a humanitarian crisis precipitated by the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. These recent developments fit within a much longer trend of restricting access to asylum and refugee protection. We are grateful to have Professor Musalo, one of the country's foremost litigators and scholars in the field, with us today to help us understand the asylum whirlwind we feel as practitioners, law students, scholars, and members of the public. Professor Shane Ellison, an asylum expert as well, will lead our discussion today. Shane is a senior lecturing fellow and supervising attorney in the Immigrant Rights Clinic here at Duke. He joined us in 2020 after serving as the legal director of the Immigrant Legal Center in Omaha, Nebraska. Before building that organization into one of the largest immigration legal service providers in the Midwest, Shane adjudicated the claims of hundreds of asylum seekers as an asylum officer for the federal government in New York. Shane currently chairs the Asylum Litigation Working Group and has been engaged in policy advocacy with the Biden administration in an effort to expand access to asylum. Shane will introduce Professor Musalo and will moderate the question and answer period following Professor Musalo's opening remarks. I will monitor the questions submitted via the webinar and pass those on to Shane. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A as they arise. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Shane. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate, um, and thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. So it is my distinct honor to be able to introduce our distinguished speaker today. Karen Musalo is a professor at law, a professor of law at UC Hastings uh, College of Law. She is the lead co-author of Refugee Law and Policy, an International and Comparative Approach. She has written extensively on refugee law issues and contributed to the evolving jurisprudence of asylum law not only through her scholarship, but through her litigation of landmark cases. She was lead attorney in matter of Kasinga, which recognized female genital mutilation as a basis for asylum. And she was counsel for amicus in matter of ARCG, the first precedent decision affirming the viability of domestic violence asylum claims. Professor Musalo is also currently co-counsel in matter of AB, in which the principle of protection in domestic violence asylum claims was challenged by Attorney General Sessions, but due in large part to Professor Masalo's advocacy, matter of AB was vacated this last summer, and her client has since been granted asylum. Professor Masalo is frequently quoted in media outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Nation, and El País. She has been interviewed on Nightline, CNN International, and NPR's All Things Considered. In addition, she was featured on the PBS documentary Breaking Free, a woman's story. Professor Masalo is also the founding director of the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies, which is internationally known for its research in legal advocacy and for its program of expert consultation to attorneys around the world. She has received numerous national awards in recognition of her work on behalf of refugees, too many in fact to recite here, 
But suffice it to say that her impact on the positive development of gender-based asylum claims is truly unparalleled. Please join me in welcoming Professor Karen Musal. Thank you very much, um, Shane, for that generous introduction. And thanks to you and Kate and the many organizations at Duke Law that sponsored um, this event. I truly am, am honored to be here with you uh, today. What I'd like to do, I'm going to speak about asylum, but I want to put it in the broader, uh, broader historical context. And so I'm going to share my screen and with the short remarks that I'll be making, I'll be using um, PowerPoint and hopefully technology will be kind and this will, this will work. Okay, there we go. Um, so I don't think even I don't think we can talk about asylum and the battles that we're seeing in protection of those fleeing persecution um, unless we look at them within this larger context of how racism and xenophobia has impacted our immigration law and policy over the centuries um, of this country's history. And there was a wonderful article that I thought summed it up in the New York Times um, last week, uh, this facing up to the racist legacy of America's immigration laws with this quote really struck me. The truth is that the mass deportation of non-white people and immigration bans based on nationality, religion, or race are quintessentially American. It's sort of a sad reality. And the article is backed up with just uh, some examples going back to the 1700s um, with restrictions on citizenship to free white individuals, um, prohibitions on the entry of, of Asian women, Chinese Exclusion Act, um, ban, you know, limiting the entry of Japanese immigrants, quotas that have existed in our law. So we see this as really the undergirdings or the, the, the structure in which our immigration system um, has been constructed. And this is really carried over into the refugee area. So let's move to a quick transition here, the 1980 Refugee Act and, and looking at, you know, in brief remarks, um, I obviously uh, am going to focus on just a couple of high points and then in the Q and A, we can go more deeply into many of the other issues um, that we're, that, that we read about in, in the headlines. So the, the Refugee Act and the protection of asylum seekers. So as many of you know, um, the international framework for refugee protection is the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 67 protocol. The U.S. is a party to the 1967 protocol. And in order to bring itself into consistency with the treaty that it signed, Congress passed the 1980 Refugee Act and adopted almost verbatim the definition of refugee that appears in the protocol the well-founded fear of persecution on account of one of these five protected grounds, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. And the Refugee Act um, prohibits the return of those whose life or freedom um, would be threatened. But the you know, metaphorical ink was no near, had barely dried on that law before uh, President, former President Ronald Reagan um, found a way to, to violate, to get around the obligations of the Refugee Act um, in regards to Haitians who were fleeing a brutal dictatorship. And Ronald Reagan entered into an agreement with the Haitian dictator Jean-Claude Duvalier that allowed the U.S. Coast Guard to go out into international waters and to stop Haitians um, Haitians in vessels at sea and to return them directly to Haiti. There was a pretense of doing some screening so that it wouldn't look like a blatant violation of the Refugee Act. But from 1981 to 1990, there were over 21,000 Haitians intercepted at sea and only six of them were allowed to apply for asylum. So you can decide for yourself whether the screening um, had any legitimacy to it. The, um, this practice was, was challenged um, it was challenged at a point where the U.S. government had even stopped the pretense of screening um, and had, was just returning Haitians directly to Haiti without even that pretext. And that practice was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court in CLV Haitian Centers Council. Um, this, the, the, there was a brief period in which Haitians 
were going to be allowed to seek asylum in the US in that time period. I don't want to go into too much sort of in the weeds, but so deep was the racism towards Haitians that even those who were going to be allowed to apply for asylum were kept at Guantanamo and not brought to US soil because if they were on US soil, then our constitutional rights would attach to them. So this was you know, at the inception, the very inception of the Refugee Act in 1980, 1990. It wasn't just the, the Haitians though that experienced the, the bias, the racism, um, the improper uh, um, consideration of, of, of foreign policy uh, objectives rather than humanitarian norms. We see the policy towards Central Americans, both past and present, with civil wars in El Salvador and Guatemala in the 1980s with accompanied by massive human rights violations and genocide, the US supporting the repressive regimes in both countries. And this was reflected in the bias policy in the 1980s during which you know, virtually no Salvadorans and Guatemalans were granted protection. So you see there's a long history to how we're treating uh, Central American asylum seekers now. And then as now the US uh, pressured Mexico to stop the flow of Salvadorans and Guatemalans. Of course, Trump ratcheted this up with the remain in Mexico, but Mexico has always been a place where the US, US used to try to contain or stop those who were seeking protection under our laws. So I've talked just a, you know, sort of a, a little bit about the procedural barriers of sort of stopping people from making it here and denying them at high levels. I want to just focus a little bit on the refugee definition itself, which, as I mentioned earlier, the U.S. adopted the definition in the international treaties, but how the U.S. has adopted such restrictive interpretations of the refugee definition that has really resulted um, in the extreme limit of protection. And so if we look at a, a couple of key aspects. So first, um, the US has almost uniformly and consistently rejected the guidance of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees that gives recommendations as to how the Refugee Convention and Protocol should be interpreted by those countries that are parties. And the US has also diverged from how other sort of similar countries, Canada, New Zealand, how they interpret um, the refugee definition. And the US has adopted what I call restrictive, counterintuitive, and I think idiosyncratic interpretation of key terms in the refugee definition, which have drastically limited protection. I'm going to focus on two that are specifically um, relevant to gender claims, uh, claims also a fear of, of, of gangs. Many of the claims of individuals from Central America are based on either gender or fear of gangs. So this really is um, focuses on what we're seeing now in terms of gaps in protection. And so these two aspects that I'm going to briefly focus on are what we call um, nexus and the definition of particular social group. And, and nexus is refers to this requirement that the, the international refugee definition is states that the persecution must be on account of one of those five grounds. There must be some linkage um, between a person's race or religion or nationality, et cetera, and the persecution that they suffer. And there's lots of different ways that this could be interpreted to show that there's just some causal connection. But the US in a Supreme Court case, INS v. Zacharias in 1992, adopted a definition of nexus that was the most difficult to establish and really counterintuitive. Um, the Supreme Court said that in, in order to prove that persecution was on account of one of the grounds, the proof, you had to prove the persecutor's motive. What was in the head of the persecutor? Which is really a difficult thing. Um, how do you prove why the persecutor you know, chose you and uh, harmed you? And no matter how grave the harm is, if you cannot prove um, the, the persecutor's motivation, the claim must fail. And this has risen to the absurdity that you might have an individual who's being uh, beaten and tortured um, and interrogated, and they might be denied protection, asylum protection, because an adjudicator could say, well, you were being beaten and tortured to get information, not because you have a political opinion such that um, this 
uh, you know, individual also wanted to harm you when eliciting the information. So we see no matter how grave the harm, individuals are, are denied if they can't prove nexus. And then the other sort of restrictive, uh, really to the point where it's, it's eviscerated the meaning of particular social group. Particular social group is one of the five grounds. And it is believed that the drafters of the convention put it in so that individuals who feared persecution um, and didn't fit within race, religion, nationality, or political opinion would have the opportunity to seek protection under this ground of um, particular social group. So many think that it was a way that the convention drafters tried to ensure that there wouldn't be a gap in protection. But um, when the US first began interpreting particular social group, it took a quite reasonable um, interpretation. And I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but maybe I can say this in a, in a very simple way. Um, the, the, there was a decision in 1985, matter of Acosta, and the Board of Immigration Appeals, the administrative body that was interpreting particular social group as a matter of first instance, said, well, it, you know, it appears in a list of other words, race, religion, nationality, political opinion. So we should interpret it similarly to how those words are understood or, or how those other terms are understood. And they all describe something about an individual that either is immutable, that they can't change about themselves, such as race or nationality, or that they shouldn't have to change to avoid persecution. And so therefore, a particular social group should be understood to be a group defined by characteristics that are immutable or fundamental. And this really allowed protection in a broad a number of, uh, uh, of cases. But as, as, as asylum seekers started to arrive in the US with the potential to, to benefit uh, by coming under the particular social group ground, we started to see the definition changing in a way that made it more, um, more and more uh, difficult. So I'm gonna very quickly go over these um, so that we have time for Q&A, but just to say matter of Kasinga, which, which Shane mentioned, which was the first uh, precedent decision recognizing, uh, recognizing asylum in a case of gender persecution, in this case, female genital cutting, was, was decided when particular social groups still was defined with that immutable or fundamental characteristics. But beginning in 1999, there, there began to be this hint of um, additional requirements to prove particular social group. And we saw it play out with um, a reversal or, or a denial of asylum in a case of a woman fleeing brutal domestic violence matter of RA. And it took 15 years. It wasn't until 2014 that the Board of Immigration Appeals granted in a precedent decision, a, a gender defined social group. And this was partly because of the difficulties posed by this, um, by adding on these additional requirements to particular social group. And I realize I haven't mentioned what they are explicitly, but instead of just showing immutable or fundamental, you have to show that the group has something called social, dis social distinction and particularity. And I will tell you that attorneys who are, uh, you know, stellar attorneys, brilliant, well steeped in the law, struggle with what those terms mean and how they can be established. And many cases are denied for failure to establish them. So we had finally, after many, many years, matter of ARCG, uh, which wasn't to live, didn't have a long life because one of the first um, earliest things that the Trump administration did is Attorney General Sessions uh, overruled ARCG. And in this decision matter of AB1, brought into question you know, the existence of a social group in a gender defined claim and also questioned nexus. Um, and the, the case had very harmful dicta about these claims and fear of gang claims. Just very quickly, I have two or three more slides and we'll go through these. So just to say that not just gender claims, but, um, but fear of gang claims, this, this issue of particular social group and nexus uh, pose a high barrier, and I think intentionally so. I don't think that the interpretation of the law and the way in which we've seen nexus and particular social group um, 
uh, made more, you know, the evidentiary requirements made more and more difficult, heightened. I don't think this is principled decision making. I think this is result oriented decision making to make these claims really um, difficult. So this is this is sort of where we are and uh, where we were, <laughs> and then the Biden administration came in. So what what has the Biden administration done? Um, regarding the, the refugee definition. It did take some, some positive measures. It vacated matter of AB and related decisions which tried to preclude protection in gender and fear of gang cases. It vacated another decision matter of LEA, which made it more difficult to establish uh, social group claims based on family. And these vacateurs returned the law to the status prior to these decisions. So you know, that's good, but as I was telling you earlier, it's not like these decisions, th these problems with um, interpretation just sprang up during the Trump administration. These are problems with a narrowing of the refugee definition that have been long in the making. So what could what could happen to fix them? Um, Congress could address these, these issues of problems in the refugee definition, but I think we know that's unlikely. And Biden could fix the interpretive issues through regulations. And so here we get to my, my last slide. Um, so many of us were very happy to see that one of uh, Biden's earliest executive orders, this executive order on creating a comprehensive framework for migration, um, directed the Attorney General and the Secretary of DHS to examine all relevant authority to evaluate whether we provide protection adequate protection for those fleeing domestic or gang violence in a manner consistent with international standards. And everything that I've been saying up to this point is we don't. And so we were glad to see, oh, this is gonna be looked at. And then there was this promise to address the circumstances under which a person should be considered a member of a particular social group. So that looked like a, there was gonna be a fix of particular social group. Um, these regulations were scheduled to be released as proposed regs by the end of October. Um, here we are, November 9th, they have not yet been. And what we hear is that they remain mired in controversy between those who argue for consistency with international law and those more interested in limiting protection. So unfortunately, the more that things change, the more they remain the same because this has been the problem over the decades. So with that, I will, I will end my, um, my remarks and look forward to um, a conversation. Thank you uh, so much, Professor Mustala, for that really rapid summary of a lot of asylum law in a real short period of time. Uh, we appreciate it. Just as a reminder for those who are joining remotely, do feel free to drop your questions in the chat and Kate will be monitoring those to pass on to me. And for any uh, folks in the room who have a question, just raise your hand and I will uh, endeavor to, to get to you and to the questions posed online. Uh, but before we get to your questions, I had a few questions of my own. And uh, Professor Masal, I wondered if you could start off um, by answering this first question. So during your career, you've witnessed and played a defining role in significant changes in asylum law in regards to refugees fleeing gender-based violence. Now that the former administration's decision in matter of AB has been vacated, and the Obama era precedent that you were involved in, matter of ARCG, has been restored, what do you see as the next frontier of gender-based asylum litigation? Thank you for that question. I, you know, vacating AB and restoring ARCG was definitely a positive step, but I don't think the law was in good, clear, um, with, I don't think the law was really um, without its problems. And, and so matter of ASR, ARCG was good. It did the best in a bad situation of bad law. So I really think we need to, the, the next sort of frontier is fixing the substantive definition of social group, of nexus, of state protection, which I know you've worked so, so much on. Um, and, and I think even if we fix the definition, we have problems with bias in the adjudicatory system. So we all know, you know, the, the, we all know that some immigration courts are, as they call asylum free zones, they just don't grant asylum. And so I think we have a lot of challenges um, before us, even with the positive moves that we've seen. Thank you for that. 
Um, another question, and this is kind of building off of that last slide in your remarks mm -hmm. about the Biden administration's regulations that are, are sort of in the, in the works, but as you say, mired in controversy. Um, you know, we're obviously behind schedule here in terms of when we expected to get those questions. Um, is there any sort of grounds for optimism for some positive changes here? Uh, where are your concerns? Um, and I guess sort of relatedly, when we do eventually get proposed uh, regulations, are there, are there ways in which law students um, can get involved in this advocacy effort? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I would not be exaggerating if I said when I read that executive order with the with the directive to review all sort of precedent and directives and, and sort of fix, you know, look at gen protection of people fleeing um, gangs and gender. I, I literally jumped with joy. And at first I was extremely optimistic because those the insiders who were involved at DHS are people who really know this and care about it. And they were looking across the refugee definition, identifying problems and really looking at ways that regs could fix those problems, but be consistent with the statute, not go beyond the statute. Um, but what we learned was that there were forces within the administration fighting hard against these changes. And I don't know if, if you or some of the other um, um, of the attendees of this webinar happened to see a November 3rd CBS News article which talked about this infighting in the administration between those who really sort of embrace Trump policies and want to limit asylum protection and those who really have a humanitarian objective. And so I think that same battle is being played out with the regulations. I think what we, including all the wonderful law students, need to do is ramp up the pressure to say that this is an important issue. Um, the Biden administration seems to be motivated, or, or those who are advising him to be, you know, to be anti-humanitarian, think that there's a political um, political points to be won, and we have to show them there's political points to be lost by taking this approach. And then law students, especially being involved when the regulations come out as proposed, I think to the degree that they don't do what the executive order has directed them to do, and they're not consistent with international standards, you know, law students have real role working together with commenting on those regs and arguing forcefully for changes so that when they're issued as final, um, they are more consistent with international standards. Thank you. Um, and I'm also um, seeing that it's, it's actually through the Q&A online that folks virtually can post questions, not through the chat. I apologize for that. And we apologize for the secret passcode required, but I understand that we're, 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 we're cooking with gas now and uh, moving forward. So we do have a question um, from, the, uh, from the webinar uh, online attendees. So Professor Masalo, any hope for gender per se as a ground of protection? Um, and do you have any tips for folks uh, practicing in one of those, as you say, asylum-free zones in some of the immigration courts that are very hostile? Yeah, things. great question. I may, I may surprise um, some of the attendees and, and the questioner by saying that I'm actually not a fan of gender per se, because yes, that might solve issues for gender claims, but it leaves everybody else who depends on particular social group out in the cold. So I think we need to properly, to argue for a proper interpretation of particular social group, because if it goes back to a cost is immutable fundamental, it will definitely include gender and it will include everybody else who needs, prote needs protection, whether it's LGBTQ individuals, uh, children, individuals with um, disabilities, and so I really want to see social group and nexus fixed rather than just doing something that that even though I want to see women protected, I want to see everyone deserve, you know, who flees persecution. In terms of practice, you know, tips for practice, I I admire and um, I admire so much those of you who practice in such hostile jurisdictions. And I would say just, you know, as I'm sure you all do, do the best you can, build the best record that you can. Um, we're going to see some changes at the Board of Immigration Appeals with some new appointments. Um, we may see some positive, additional positive developments at the federal courts. And so make your record. Even if you know that your judge is going to deny, make your record so that you can re reverse, you know, get a good chance of arguments um, on appeal. 
Yeah, here here in North Carolina, we have to we have to play the long game. So um, very sage wisdom there. Thank you very much for that. Um, Want to be mindful for any questions in the audience? I will keep an eye. Yes, here. Yeah, excellent question. So for those who are joining remotely, the question is about the Title 42 public health expulsions and, um, you know, obviously shocked in many ways to see that kind of continuing, maybe not shocked based on your introductory remarks, but where where is the future of Title 42 and maybe um, when can we hope to perhaps get past those expulsions? Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and I, I, it's, um, you know, many of us suspected that that Biden really was, you know, didn't believe T Title 42, Trump, you know, Trump imposed Title 42 as a total pretext. We know it wasn't about health. And Biden came in, you know, trying to hide behind that pretext. And now we know that there are certain people in the administration and the article that I referred to earlier, the CBS News article, uh, talked about Ron Klain and Susan Rice in particular as being individuals who argued for maintaining Title 42 because of the optics and the political downfall of the appearance of chaos at the border. And as I you know, said before, and I truly believe in this, we need to raise our voices, mobilize, be active, and make the point that there are, there are political points, serious ones, you know, loss of support of his base to continue a policy that is so immoral and so unlawful and you know the number of public health experts that have come out and said this is not necessary, and the number of people and, and Shane, I know you know this too. The, the number of people in the advocacy community have come forward with specific plans about how people could be admitted to keep the receiving community safe. And so this just is um, is immoral to exponential degrees, and we need to keep really you know, opposing it and advocating for a change with everything we've got. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Other questions from the audience? We can take one from the webinar. Um, is the impact of public pressure now as compared to Kasinga when, when your client appeared on 60 Minutes? Maybe you could speak to sort of like the evolving role in which uh, social pressure uh, can play here, you know, both in this moment, sort of building upon your previous answer on advocacy against Title 42 and sort of helping us see the historical context of when advocacy efforts um, existed around the past or the decision in that uh, groundbreaking decision matter of Kasinga. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I do think that, that use of the media educates people and helps to mobilize people. And when people are mobilized, they take action and they communicate with their um, representatives, with their Congress members, with the administration. And that's what it takes. I do think that the Biden administration um, uh, incorrectly believes that they're not gonna lose that much by maintaining this position. And so with the Kasinga case, um, this was during the Clinton administration and there was a, a, you know, a lot of um, pressure brought to bear that made people very sympathetic to her claim. And even though there was fear of floodgates because this was you know, recognizing asylum for somebody fleeing female genital cutting and there's so many women subject to it, the, the public support was so palpable and articulated and that you know, that had um, an impact. So I do think the Biden administration is susceptible to that kind of pressure. Um, I think the Trump administration was a different situation where you sometimes have administrations that are not really susceptible of being shamed. I think there were only one or two instances where Trump did something that, um, he backed off because of public outcry and the family separation was one of them. But I do think the Biden administration um, is susceptible to it. And the same way that we sort of opened the door in the Kasinga case with media, same thing about, around other decisions. Um, I, I think it's one of many strategies that we need to, um, to utilize is use of the media, mobilization of grassroots, you know, pressure on politicians. Excellent. People power still has has the potential for making an impact here, right? 
Um, uh, another another question, and this is kind of shifting gears a little bit. Um, so on August 20th, the Biden administration proposed a regulation that purports to streamline and simplify the credible fear and asylum adjudication process for individuals encountered at or near the U.S. border by giving asylum officers greater authority to grant final relief, but also by circumscribing the immigration court's review of asylum officer denials. Um, this proposal garnered criticism from a large cross-section of asylum advocates who were both surprised and disappointed by the proposal. And so a couple of questions for you, Professor Masala. What, if anything, does this proposal tell us about how the, the Biden administration is looking to reform existing asylum procedures? And do you expect the final version to be informed or improved by advocates' criticisms? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, so this the 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 proposed reg had you know positive and negative things and probably most would say on the balance more negative the positive thing was giving initial jurisdiction of asylum cases to asylum officers which are generally a generally um you know because they're less adversarial it's generally a better venue for asylum seekers but it also contemplated the continued use of expedited removal which is a fast tracking um you know, screening mechanism for asylum seekers. But, but the, the section giving jurisdiction to asylum officers was generally positive. What was very negative was that sort of the trade-off was that then the regulation said, you know, the way it exists now is if you are not granted by an asylum officer, you can bring your case to the immigration court and, and put on, you know, a de, a de novo hearing, start from scratch. But what this, the proposed regulations did was basically totally truncated and cut back um, the rights to put forward your case in immigration court. What does this tell us if we look at this? Um, I think, and, I, and I've talked to some government insiders, so I think this is correct. DHS, the asylum officers are under DHS. And so the asylum officer part of the regulation was, was, was somewhat positive. The immigration court, which is coming from DOJ, was super negative. So I think there's different perspectives coming from the agencies. And I have actually heard the same thing in the, um, the regulations that we talked about a little bit earlier, the social group definition that where DHS is compared to where DOJ is. DOJ is, is, is the obstacle, um, certain parts of within DOJ. I want to um, and, and so what does this tell us? It, it tells us that there's an ongoing controversy again within the administration. Um, hard to predict, because I think your question was, you know, will, will this be improved by, you know, there were so many comments that were great comments, um, criticisms that were so thoughtful. Um, I think it's hard to predict how much it'll in, be improved by those comments um, because we don't know who's gonna win out in the in the internal battles in the agencies. All right, to be determined. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, questions from the audience? I will go to one. Yeah. Uh, Professor Masala alluded to the fact that the success or failure of an asylum claim kind of varies wildly depending on venue. And I was just wondering to the extent like what tools are available to Biden other than changing the regulations or tightening those? <coughs> Yeah, great question. So for the benefit of those uh, participating remotely, the question relates, Professor Mala, Masala, to your observation about um, the disparate asylum decisions and, and kind of grant rates varying so widely from one jurisdiction to the next and kind of thinking about um, a, a solution to that problem. What, what, if anything, can sort of be done to kind of improve greater levels of consistency and decision making between jurisdictions here? I mean, I think first of all, we need to have um, better training of immigration judges and looking at those who are outliers and looking how, you know, why, why is that happening? What's the nature of these decisions? I think we need to have better, um, uh, how can I say this? Really have an emphasis on hiring immigration judges from diverse backgrounds. One of the biggest correlations in grant and denial rates is the background of the adjudicator and those who come from an enforcement background correlates with having higher denial rates. And so I think we need to have draw from more diverse 
um, pool of, of individuals. I, we also need to have an appellate body, the Board of Immigration Appeals, that seriously reviews um, and you know, reverses decisions that are incorrectly made. And what we've had you know, over, especially I think with the Trump administration, um, the appointment to the BIA of all of the high deniers on the immigration courts. So there's a big fix that's needed. And it's probably, you know, there's others who have thought more than I have just about the, the many, many pieces of how we fix the immigration court and the BIA, but they need fixing. I can't emphasize it more enough that it is not justice. It is as colleagues who wrote a book called Refugee Roulette. It, it is really refugee roulette and nobody's life should be subject to you know, the, the coincidence of which court their case is assigned to. Um, moving now to a question from the webinar and kind of shifting gears a little bit further to think about Afghanistan. Professor Masala, what would you like to see for all the Afghan arrivals? Should they have to go through the asylum process or do you support something like the Afghan Adjustment Act that would make the process smoother? Yeah, no, I definitely do. I really do support um, the, um, the, the, the act, the Afghan Adjustment Act, which would allow parolees to obtain LPR status without applying for asylum. I, I think, you know, we talk about the system being backlogged. Why add all of these cases to the system? Um, and it's clear that these are individuals who, um, you know, <laughs> it's clear these are individuals to whom protection should be granted. And this is a way to do it. I would also say there are other, you know, problems with what the, the Biden administration, um, its response, they have been totally, you know, there have been calls to um, continue the evacuation of at-risk at Afghans because there are many who remain and to need and a need to fix the humanitarian um, parole system. There have been, if I'm not mistaken, you know, 20,000 plus applications for humanitarian parole and there has not been one approved since uh, the end of August. So there is some real work to do in terms of responding um, to, the, to the humanitarian crisis created by um, the US withdrawal. And it was a withdrawal that was um, really with not enough thought and advance action given to how it would leave our allies and under, other individuals at risk. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. So you might be able to hear me from here, I don't know. Um, but Professor Mansalo, you talked earlier about um, clarifying or making a more ideal definition of a particular social group. Would you mind expanding on what you view as that ideal definition or what we should be looking for in a better definition of a particular social group? Were you able to hear the question? Was it what was the ideal, what, what should be the ideal definition of a particular social group? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think going back to um, the BIA decision matter of Acosta, the, the legal standard set in that decision, which is that a social group be defined by an immutable or fundamental characteristic, so something the individual cannot change about themselves or something the individual shouldn't have to change in order to avoid persecution, and included in that definition are also past actions that an individual may have taken, which we call sort of historical past, right? It can't be changed. So if you're targeted because you refused to uh, pay, um, you know, you, you refused a demand of a, of a gang member and you're targeted for that reason, that would be an immutable characteristic. That's something that you did that wouldn't change. And so the immutable or fundamental is, is a clear, straightforward, easily applied standard that the UNHCR itself has adopted, the UNHCR has proposed that there be alternative, either immutable fundamental or something they call social perception, but not the two together. Um, and so it's, it's a good standard. And I have not had anybody, I've asked so many people this, whenever I propose this and people sort of like are not sure, I say to them, name for me a social group that wouldn't fit the immutable or fundamental, somebody deserving of protection that wouldn't fit. And I have yet to have somebody be able to come forward to me and say, 
it's X. So I think it's very, very workable. And that is what um, the allies within DHS would like to do is return to Acosta. And that's, there's a lot of conflict over that specific issue. Uh, perhaps as a final question, since we're unfortunately out of time, but to maybe end on a, on a positive note, um, as I mentioned in your introduction, you know, we were also delighted to see that Miss AB uh, has been granted asylum. And so I wondered if you might uh, be able to share with us now that she has asylum, how is she doing? She's, as you can imagine, she is just so um, relieved. She is so grateful. She also is very aware of all the other women whose claims were impacted, were and will continue to be impacted by the actions taken in her case. And so she's incredibly gratified to see that the door might be opening again. So not just for the protection that she's been able to access, but for what it means for, for, for other women um, fleeing brutal violence. So it's really, um, it, it really has been a, a wonderful thing to see um, her protected and her, her, her sense of safety after all, all the backs and forths of her case. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Professor Masalo, for your time here. It has just been absolutely lovely to, to hear from you. It's such an inspiration. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to all who joined and tuned in virtually. Um, for those of you who are physically present, we do have lunch outside. So do feel free to um, take advantage of that. And thank you all for being with us.